Lesson three, guys, is going to be on nuclear fusion and fission. So we'll be looking at natural versus artificial transmutations, nuclear binding energy, and the difference between fusion and fission reactions. So when we talk about artificial and natural transmutations, you need to understand what reactants are. Reactants are what we call the starting materials. So for artificial transmutations, you will always have two reactants. These are not spontaneous reactions because they are requiring energy. So in an artificial transmutation, you are literally bombarding or colliding these two starting materials that I circled in red. You're colliding them in one of those large hadron colliders, and it's causing them to fuse together and release some energy particles. If you look at the natural transmutation, it is just one thing decaying over time. Is the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC for short. It's a 27-kilometer particle accelerator sitting under the border of France and Switzerland. It's an atom smasher, the biggest in the world, designed and built by thousands of engineers, scientists, and mathematicians from across our tiny planet with the goal of helping other scientists learn about things of incredibly small size by smashing them together. These smashings are called collisions. This is really all they're interested in. Yeah. They're interested in collisions, collisions, collisions. The LHC is a ring containing two beams going in opposite directions. But if we look closer, that beam is actually made up of bunches of protons. In fact, each bunch has about 100 billion protons each. And these bunches are about 30 centimeters long, um, typically about a millimeter di dimensions as they're going around the ring. And um, so think about a long, thin, tapered piece of spaghetti. Incredibly powerful superconducting magnets keep the beams flying at nearly the speed of light with the aim of making these proton bunches hit. We pass these thin hairs through each other and we get about 30 collisions. So most of the, most of the protons just miss each other and they carry on around the ring. They come back, late, come back one turn later and they can do it again. And the reason why they miss each other is because atoms are mostly empty space. The target this year, just to put it in context, is about 800 million collisions a second. So we really kind of, we have to work hard to get that rate. Hundreds of millions per second is insane. So they, they collide about 25 nanoseconds. So you have a bunch colliding with another bunch. You may have a proton here and a proton here, which has a hard, what we call scattering, a hard event. And out of that comes out a whole mess of particles. This is what she's talking about. When two protons collide, it looks like this. To you and me, this may look like a whole mess of particle parts, but to Dr. Bose, this mess can actually tell you what's inside a proton. Physicists find neutrons, kaons, pions, muons, and neutrinos. By the way, physicists call particles that are made of these things hadrons, hence the name Large Hadron Collider. Proton collisions like these help physicists reveal exactly what these tiny structures that make up our universe are made of. The technology is super advanced, but the science is the same as it's always been. We simply break things apart, hoping to understand how they tick. On reference table N, you see a list of selected radioisotopes. Those will naturally go through their transmutations as listed in the decay modes. So uranium-235 uh, when you look it up, it has an alpha decay, and it comes out with a daughter isotope of thorium-231. Uh, notice that there's only one reactant. And then artificial decay, you'll notice you can't find aluminum-27 on the chart because it's going through artificial transmutation, uh, which requires a particle, which is why there's two reactants. So binding energy is when energy is created from mass, and that energy is used to bind the nucleons, which are protons and neutrons, together. That's how the core of the atom sticks together, is through this binding energy. So for the nucleus to remain intact, the nucleons, protons and neutrons, must be bound together by attractive forces that are strong enough to overcome the repulsive forces between the protons, because protons, positively charged, don't want to stick together. Physicists recently have discovered that the mass of the nucleus is actually less than the sum of its nucleons. So one proton, one neutron would give you a mass of two, but they've actually determined it's actually slightly less. Because it's slightly less, we call that mass that's lost, that is called the mass defect. And that mass that is lost is your binding energy, the energy that is used to bind the nucleons together. 
So mass defect is accounted for in Albert Einstein's famous formula E equals mc squared. It's such a small amount of mass that is lost, it's almost insignificant in any calculations. So we say it's negligible mass. So in a fission reaction, you have a neutron and it is shot at a heavy radioactive source. When we say heavy, that means its mass number is big. So in this example, we use uranium. 235. When that neutron hits the uranium-235, it splits and it splits into krypton and barium, and in the process it releases a tremendous amount of energy. So biggest thing to take from this is that large mass, one large mass, breaks up into two or more smaller masses. So in a fission reaction, if the number of neutrons released is not controlled, we have what we call a chain reaction. A chain reaction is a series of reactions in which the reaction is initiated by the energy produced in the previous reaction. Therefore, when we talk about atomic bombs, this is the type of reaction that we use in nuclear bombs. It's an unstable chain reaction of energy production. The chain only ends when there's no more fissionable material left. Oh, that can't be good. Hey! Wait! 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 Stop! Sir Grace, don't wait for me! Minus 15 seconds. Fission reactors, however, use a controlled environment. So in a nuclear reactor, the heat from a fission reaction is used to heat water. The radioactive hot water from the reactor under certain pressure um, is used to boil clean water, which is non-radioactive. The clean steam used, um, is used to turn the turbine, which then generates the electricity. Fuel rods contain the fissionable radioactive substance, such as uranium-235. So this is the type of fuel that we use inside of all of the nuclear power plants in America. The graphite control rods in the core of the reactor is used to absorb some of the neutrons. The movable control rods are adjusted so that they can absorb some or, some or all of the remaining neutrons as desired. We call these control rods because they are able to control the amount of neutrons in the system, which controls the amount of fission reactions that actually occur. Which controls the amount of energy you produce. Right. So if your control rods inside your reactor are all the way down, all the neutrons are being absorbed, and there'll be no heat occurring. So therefore, the reaction is at a standstill. It's at zero, zero output of energy. Right. A nuclear bomb does not have control rods, which is why it just keeps going on. Yep. And once it uses up all the uranium, then the bomb's over. The fusion reaction is the opposite of fission. If fission is to split, fusion is to combine together. So fusion reactions use very light nuclei. We're talking about hydrogen. It's only hydrogen. Anytime you see a question on fusion, it's always involving hydrogen. So this means you're fusing together hydrogens to make slightly heavier atoms. So fusion reactions always will occur in stars, such as our sun, and are the source of all heat and energy that the star produce. So in the sun, fusion occurs between atoms of tritium, which is hydrogen with a mass of three, and deuterium, which is hydrogen with a mass of two, to produce helium and a neutron. 
The major challenge in building nuclear fusion reaction is the high temperatures produced. Um, it's about 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 9th degrees Celsius. Which is incredibly high. It's, it's in the billions of degrees. Right. In a tokamak fusion reactor, the starting materials are heated until they become plasma, a sea of highly charged ions and electrons. It's a certain type of phase. The highly charged plasma is kept away from the sides by extremely powerful electromagnets. At MIT, they have a plasma science and fusion center, and they actually have a reactor that can conduct these fusion reactions for only a few seconds. Because of the fact that the machine gets to billions of degrees hot, they have to actually use liquid nit nitrogen, which is negative 196 degrees Celsius, and they have to cool the reactor in this until it's ready for the next possible burst. If they decided not to do the liquid nitrogen bath, the machine would probably malfunction and start to melt down. So moral of the story, it's difficult because this reaction gets very, very hot and it's really hard to cool it down. So fusion reactions are actually great. They uh, produce more energy than fission, so they're better producers of energy than using uranium. It's really easy to gather hydrogen because it's the most abundant element in the universe. There are no chain reactions, so therefore it's not going to spontaneously cause an eruption or an explosion that would destroy or wipe off a section of the planet. And they don't make any waste. The only waste that it makes is heat, which goes into the atmosphere and then goes into the universe, or it makes helium, which we can then use as party balloons to fill party balloons. The disadvantage, however, is that it's incredibly expensive. It's very costly to make all these uh, apparatuses and machines, and only a very select few people on the planet right now have the ability to even start making prototypes of fusion reactors.